Today's episode of Lone Star Lawyers on the Varsity Podcast Network is brought to you by Varsity Search. Varsity Search builds great teams by connecting lawyers in Texas with career opportunities at small and boutique law firms. So if you're thinking of making a move or your law firm is looking to hire, please go to varsitysearch.com and book a time to visit right into my calendar. Varsity Search, building great teams. Hey everyone, Daniel Hare back with you on Lone Star Lawyers. I hope you and your family are both healthy and safe. And before we get into this episode, I want to let you know that the market does seem to be heating up towards the end of the year with a number of law firms looking to make key hires. Uh, some of them will start in the fourth quarter. M- many of them will probably start uh, in January, uh, but the process is happening now. And so we are working on filling a number of job opportunities all over the state. So if you or someone you know might have an interest please email me, daniel at varsitysearch.com or go to varsitysearch.com slash lawyers. All right, today our guest is Matthew Myers. Matthew is a partner at MW Law in Austin. They also have offices in Dallas and around the country. He is in Austin where he practices inbound U.S. and outbound global immigration law. And Matthew was recognized by Austin Monthly as a top attorney in immigration law and by best lawyers ones to watch. He is active both in the Austin and San Antonio Bar Associations and serves on the Global Migration Section and University Committee of the American Immigration Lawyers Association. All right, with that, let's hop into our conversation with Matthew Myers on today's Monday Mentors episode of Lone Star Lawyers. Matthew Myers joins us right now. Matthew, thanks for taking the time to be with us. Thanks for having me. Well, I, I gave a very brief introduction before uh, we hopped on here, but uh, I'd love to hear from you a little more about uh, your practice, your firm, and I know you've recently gone through a transition, so would love to hear about that. But just uh, let's start with just uh, telling us a little more about uh, what you do. Yeah, so I I just started my immigration practice after working for most of the past decade for a large immigration law firm, handling a high volume of primarily investor and employment immigration cases. And so it's definitely exciting to to have my own practice. I I partnered with uh, two friends of mine who had a complex business and real estate transactional firm. Um, And also they they have a title company, which helps with the, the real estate. And so I started there. Yeah, I started their immigration section. Uh, and it, it ties in well because they're, it's very international focused in terms of investment and, and business. Um, so, so, yeah, that's, that's where I am now. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um, and what is happening right now in the immigration law world? It seems like there's always something happening. Um, and I think I just read something yesterday about a new... The Trump administration, H-1B uh, initiative or, or order or whatever. Uh, so uh, tell us kind of what's going on and what are the, the kind of hot buttons right now in your world? Well, to answer what you just raised, uh, as an example, uh, the Trump administration today, Thursday, we're recording this October, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, October 8th, um, they're changing the definition of the default most popular professional visa for how to qualify, for what types of jobs qualify. The government had been uh, challenging these filings, saying that if if you're going to be a, a professional, you need to have a degree in the exact field of your profession. So for uh, certain professions, there isn't an exact degree. So software developer. There's no software developer degree. It's either computer science or uh, sometimes they have an engineering degree. And so they're pushing through without going through the normal rulemaking procedure, a number of things, including what's what they're doing by, by just announcement, this interim rule without going through the APA. And so it's likely to be quickly enjoined as a lot of things 
have, <laughs> yeah. have <laughs> so to get back to your general question I, I think that a lot of people including me just kind of that question you know what's going on during a pandemic with the Trump administration leading up to an election in the immigration fields I I gave a an update presentation to the San Antonio Bar Association uh, in June or July, and there were 13 major developments in immigration uh, since January of this year. <laughs> yeah, and now I I'm looking at it, and uh, over the past couple of months, I'm going to give another update presentation, but this time to the Austin Bar Association in November. And I'm having to add maybe a, a third. I'm, I'm adding maybe, a, you know, five new things that have happened over the past couple of months. that are major developments. I um, mean, I know you were going to ask me about COVID later and I can get into all of the things, but but there, I really can't get into all of this, the things without a full hour or more to <laughs> to explain. <laughs> yeah. And we'd have to apply for CLE credit. And all that stuff. <laughs> So, so we'll, we'll maybe do that another day, uh, but we should. Um, and, and so uh, it are, are most like the thing, like thing we just talked about that's happening today, this week, um, and some of the other stuff that the administration has done. Are, are those all things that, you know, if, if there's a new administration in January, uh, how, how much of this is essentially done by the executive and can be re- reversed by the executive? And, and what has the, has, I haven't looked to see kind of what, uh, Biden's platform is with regards to some of this immigration, uh, these immigration policies. So, um, what 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 might we expect uh, January twenty first if it's President Biden when it comes to immigration? That's a great question. Stephen Miller is the mastermind behind the Trump administration's immigration policies, and I, I don't know why, but I think about a quote from Harry Potter whenever I think about Stephen Miller. He's He's kind of Voldemort, in my opinion. <laughs> you know, it's it's, it's uh, you've got to respect him. He's done incredible things, things that have never been imagined. Um, you know, just in January of this year, President Trump uh, shut down travel from from China for the most part, and that had never been really done. Um, shut down. He's shut down travel from Brazil, from Europe and then targeted specific visas, H-1B visa, L-1 visa, which are two of the most popular visas for foreign direct investment and for professionals, and also J-1 visas, uh, cultural exchange visas. And he's, he's just said, you know, there is a law that says that the president can suspend the entry of, uh, of non-immigrants or immigrants, uh, basically as he sees fit. But I don't think that anyone imagined the law being applied as as broadly or the the authority being applied as broadly to just say, you know, that all of, you know, all of this, these classes of people can't come in the United States. I think it was intended more for, you know, limited use. Uh, and so um, there they the Trump administration had already uh attacked legal immigration as much or more than illegal immigration. Uh, and so, uh, so, so many things have been done over the past few years and the pandemic created a good excuse or a good tool to further shut things down. Uh, literally the majority of immigration. And I know that immigration attorneys that I respect are adding practice areas uh, or retiring or saying that threatening they're going to retire. And I think that they're serious if we get another four years of this administration. And so I am hopeful that a, uh, frankly, I'm hopeful that a Biden administration can open uh, up uh, the United States to foreign investment again. Uh, And, uh, you know, as an immigration attorney, I, I want there to be strong laws and a legal immigration system, but also a pathway for people uh, to follow those laws. And so, uh, I don't think that shutting down the immigration system is good for our economy or it's good for the United States in general. So, uh, I think that a lot could change and I'm hopeful that the Biden administration is just as organized as the Trump administration and Stephen Miller has been in restricting immigration. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting to see for sure. It, uh, 
when immigration was a major campaign issue in 2016, and, and it just hasn't been in 2020, mostly because of COVID, but other things too. And so uh, that'll be interesting to see how it plays out, uh, regardless of who wins the election, kind of what the next four years of immigration policy looks like. Um, well, I, I did want to talk about COVID. You mentioned it before. Um, how has that played into uh, your uh, your clients uh, and your work, um, the immigration uh, uh policies and, and, and processes and all of that, what, what has the impact been um, uh, beyond what we've already kind of talked about so far? Um, there's a lot of fear and confusion. And, and uh, so oftentimes that creates an opportunity for well-informed um, and more competent attorneys to thrive and to help clients get through more difficult issues. Um, but when it's coupled with the uh, economic recession um, and, and and quite literally the, some of the obstacles are insurmountable uh, that have been placed on the, the immigration system. Uh, for example, that I haven't talked about uh, in March, all of the U.S. embassies and consulates were uh, effectively shut down and closed, including services to Americans. We were getting emergency passport applications uh, for people that were trying to get back uh, and then they were stopping even that for U.S. citizens, which is the last thing that they do is shut down U.S. citizen services. So they've slowly been reopening and we're having to get more creative in requesting exemptions and, you know, following up in different ways with the consulates. So it's it's more interesting times, but not necessarily great on the client um, that things are getting more expensive and more complicated. and um, so. These are these are definitely 2020 is an interesting year uh, in immigration. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Absolutely. Um, what about just how it's impacted uh, the way that you work uh, uh, and uh, how has that gone in um, in uh, presumably shifting to a remote or, or online practice almost <laughs> uh, from home or, wh- or however you've done that, uh, along with obviously the transition to uh, your own practice in a new firm, kind of what's that been like? Uh, it's been interesting. I, uh, been working from home. I've got a great, uh, home office set up at this point. Um, but I'm looking forward to, uh, I think I've got the cabin fever of being at home and having, <laughs> uh, I've, I've reached my capacity there. So I, I, um, we have, uh, physical offices now that I've joined in, uh, San Antonio and, and Austin. Um, and we were pr- predominantly in, in Dallas before then. So I am trying to, to transition to, you know, as, as safe as possible to getting into the office so that I can separate out uh, work from personal, um, which I think, at least for me, mental health wise, it's good to leave things at work. And, and right now I'm pretty much working 24 7. Uh, just the way that, you know, it's a, I'm at home. So if I see an email, I'll go, I'll go, <laughs> you know, respond. And, and I, it's my own business now, basically. So uh, that's been an interesting transition, but also having your own business. I don't think I'd ever go back to being an employee because, uh, and, and maybe you, you feel this way too, Daniel, <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, you know, so if I don't have any appointments until, noon one day you know that gives me flexibility in the morning to do other things or to sleep in if i really want to i'll end up working until midnight that night but at least i have all the control there yeah it's uh it it would it would seem hard to go back to (laughs) it's like i i kind of relate it to uh and i talk to lawyers about this sometimes that have gone in-house and then are like thinking about going back to law firms it's like eh, (laughs) once they've gone in-house it's kind of hard to make that shift back to uh Oh, billing hours again and all that stuff, especially. But it's, I think, similar from going from, yeah, being an employee, um, all of the responsibility uh, to make things happen, too. And so, uh, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's been fun. Um, the, the other thing, I, and I don't know exactly kind of the nature of the nuts and bolts of, of your practice, how much of that, I mean, were you already essentially able to do um, most of the actual work that you do? 
on paper and writing and by uh, online type stuff? I didn't, are there uh, other types of immigration, either hearings or other things where in, in the non-COVID world or pre-COVID world, you would be going in front of some type of administrative law judge or immigration judge or something like that? How, how has that changed, if at all? Yeah, that's a good question. Within immigration, uh, so I do employment and investor immigration, and then there are others that do asylum cases. And I've actually volunteered and taken on some asylum and removal cases lately, uh, pro bono. Uh, they're still making on the asylum and, and removal defense side, they're still making them go into immigration court in person uh, and then doing video conferencing in. Uh, of the uh, folks that are detained um, or or if they're not detained, having them also come in person to be interviewed as a witness. Um, and so that's still ongoing. But fortunately for me, uh, predominantly employment and investor immigration practice, it's uh, scanned copies and paper filings with the government and they're allowing for uh, signatures to be reproduced and in, in terms of they'll send me a scan copy and I'll print it out. Uh, so they don't have to mail those to me, which is good. Uh, and so I've got clients across the United States and it's actually making it right. easier because they don't have to FedEx me the signature pages. Um, right. So, so, so that's been, that's been good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good. Um, well, I want to transition uh, now and uh, dig in a little bit to uh, how you uh, initially, as a new lawyer, uh, how you kind of came about and came up in terms of um, things that you learned, things that helped you develop. Um, what's maybe something that you you picked up in the first couple of years of practice um, that uh, you feel like was a really important lesson and something that you've hung on to and still you know practice today? So something that that they said that I picked up on it at Baylor Law School that I think it may have been missed by many or may, may, maybe, you know, it just seems like I'm the only one that kind of took this to heart or not only. Sorry, it's not, I'm not the only one. Sorry, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> but but uh, it was uh, I really did take the attitude of I'm going to get in before every single person at this firm and I'm going to leave after every single person at the firm. Uh, there's not going to be anyone here that works harder. Uh, and I know that people at work, uh, of course, all non Baylor lawyers, uh, they, they, they may, may or may not have had that attitude, um, that I did. And so I, but I think I distinguished myself at that firm for that reason. Yeah. Uh, and I got some opportunities a few years in after really putting in the time. So, uh, that that attitude worked well for me of just, you know, uh, I, it was funny internally. I, I heard, you know, we don't want to encourage him too much or say the wrong thing because maybe he'll stop doing this. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Uh, but but I, I, it resulted in opportunities for me uh, that, that I otherwise would not have had if I didn't put my head down the first few years. And I'm glad that I, you know, I've, I got the question one time. Uh, you know, what would you say to a young lawyer going into immigration or any practice area? And I really do think at least for five years, uh, you know, maybe less, maybe more, uh, getting for me with uh, high volume and high complexity uh, with an established firm uh, handling that type of work. Um, you know, I got maybe 20 or 30 years of experience if I'd have just gone out on my own to start. I think it's, it was really important. Um, you know, there's some frustrations, um, internal political drama of being in a big firm. Uh, but, but I think that it's, it was kind of my, uh, you know, resident, the equivalent of a residency for a doctor that I, I really needed that, uh, that experience to, to get where I am now. Yeah, that's a, I think a, a good way to, to talk about it and think about it because I think, um, you, you know, one of the struggles that a lot of lawyers have, uh, and, and, and young lawyers too, in trying to pick where they want to work, um, in, in this era, uh, is kind of that work-life balance issue. Um, and it does seem like that that is something that, uh, is considered from kind of day one, year one, 
Um, and uh, I, I think that's tough when you when you're trying when you're going uh, competing against people like uh, you and others who are, are taking kind of that first few years as a residency as a as sort of a uh, I'm still learning I'm still in law school kind of part two. Um, and, and trying to do that 10,000 hours to become the expert and, 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 and all of that. Um, how would you or, or how have you kind of uh, thought about that or, or talked about that with with other associates in terms of, you know, when is the right time to think about work life balance? Is there a way to do it within that residency period or how, how would that work? Um, and uh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm curious what your th- thoughts are on that. Yeah, I feel like there are people like me who, who have that attitude of, uh, working, um, long hours and, you know, you know, taking it with, as a badge of honor, um, and, you know, just putting their head down and then the other people that want the work-life balance from day one and maybe don't put in the time. Uh, and, and, and I find that, you know, the, the latter, you know, don't necessarily get as far ahead in their practice as early as, as, as the people that, that work hard for the first few years. So I, I'm only recently personally finding kind of a work-life balance. So yeah. I'm not the best to answer the question. But I think <laughs> depending on who you are as a person, I, I think you need to be introspective. And, and um, the people that, like me, work hard to begin can be taken advantage of uh, by um, partners or by others uh, dumping on dumping work on you know a lot in our practice as lawyers the good people often end up doing the most work it seems they you know because they're trusted and so the the hard workers need to make sure that they're advocating for pay to be increased accordingly um and, and so i think it it depends on on your personality type and i i do think if I'm talking to one personality type that's more of they're already focused on making sure they have a good work life balance and they're more focused on life than work, I'd say the opposite of what I'd say to someone like me, which is, hey, relax. <laughs> you need yeah. to, you need to get, you know, it's important for someone like me to get a break because you're gonna make mistakes if you don't unwind and if you just work all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think also that raises the idea in my mind that because uh, I, I talk to two, three, four, five year lawyers pretty often. And, you know, um, I, I think one of the things to for everyone to keep in mind is that, um, you know, not every person's three years of law practice is the same. And and so um, this third year lawyer and that third year lawyer may be on paper, both third year lawyers. Uh, but if they've uh, taken your approach um, and done what you did versus someone who, you know, maybe, you know, worked uh, 1400 hours a year, or 1600 hours a year instead of however many you did. Um, I mean, that there is a compiling factor to that, not just the hours, but but just all of the additional just experience and wisdom and opportunities and setbacks and and all the things that come with it. Right. And so um, when you're looking at, OK, why is maybe, um, you know, this third year lawyer either being paid more or less than another or why is are they getting more opportunities or not? You know, that all goes together um, and uh, and kind of goes back to the original point that you made, which is, you know, the way that you take full advantage of that is to be the one that uh, gets in there and establishes their value uh, to that firm early and often. Right. Exactly. Awesome. Um, so if that was something that you picked up at law, in law school or soon after, um, is there anything that you've uh, learned more recently in practice um, that maybe you wish you had known or uh, that you, uh, you you just didn't either realize or, or, or just came about it later uh, that you'd want to share? Yeah, I think that uh, it's important as attorneys, the, the legal field is very political and uh, I, th- I think that it's important to look out for yourself and, and maybe I was a little bit more naive going into it mm. of thinking, you know, you, you start with a firm and then everyone has your best interest at heart and, 
and you know everyone wants you to succeed but we're in a competitive world and uh you know there's if if you watch the tv show suits you know that's yeah that's an exaggeration but i think that the field is uh it can get can get uh pretty interesting and dramatic and political and so uh, i and i also think kind of i mean that so that's kind of what i learned is is the that there it's as, as someone that's a hard worker um, you need to make sure that you're, you're earning what you should or, you know, advocating for yourself as much as you can, especially as a young lawyer. And there are these old school law firm mindsets that you encounter um, that are, you know, we, we went through this horrible experience. So you have to go through this horrible experience or, um, you know, expecting you to work for the firm for your entire life uh, that uh, that may be changing because there's a lot of lateral transfers. And so I think it's important for people that uh, I, I have attorneys that have worked for the same firm for their whole uh, friends that have worked for the same firm for 10, 15, 20 years, which is great. Uh, but I, I think that in the current environment and in the world and in our practice, it's you you need to find the best fit for you um and i've i've had people that have changed practice areas completely so uh you know don't necessarily get comfortable uh if you're happy you're happy but if you're unhappy you know feel free to move and make changes in your life yeah i'm really glad you raised this issue. I'm curious how it impacts and maybe it would even change how you would have done things differently um, in terms of how you uh, approach relationships in the workplace um, and how you, I mean, you know, like you're saying, it's super competitive uh, or, or at least can be and how you go about, um, you know, building relationships with colleagues, with other associates, with partners, even, um, but also knowing that, you know, if, 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 or if you figure out that someone um, is really either just in it for themselves or in it for the firm, but not necessarily for you uh, or doesn't have your interest, whatever, how, how do you kind of walk that out and, um, you, you know, be a team player, but also, you know, keep your career in its proper perspective and, and kind of keep, I don't know if caution is the right word, but just sort of be on guard for, for kind of people like that? I mean, how do you kind of do that um, and, and, and sort of just practically develop relationships in a healthy way? It's, it's a tough, tough question, tough answer. Um, <laughs> I would say I, I wish I'd have started becoming more independent as both a, a lawyer in terms of knowledge of, of the practice area started at day one saying, you know, how would I do this if I had to do this on my own without uh, 40 colleagues around me who are experts in immigration law? Um, you know, it's easy to just walk down the hall and ask them a question. Um, and uh, so it took me longer to feel comfortable uh, starting my own practice uh, because I, you know, was so uh, I was handling such a high volume that it was easy to just ask the question, hey, what, what do I do here? Um, and so, um, what was, uh, there was res resentment of, you know, uh, certain opportunities that I got, um, and, and even from partners, uh, in the firm, which was interesting. And then I would get, uh, I would have creative legal ideas that, that my, the, the partner that I worked for was supportive of and that were successful. Uh, but I would often get from the the older partners, um, no, we've never done that. That's never going to work. And 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 so it was kind of that attitude um, that I uh, I didn't like and and wanted to to you know to to make sure that we were giving the best advice to clients and coming up with new ideas and getting flexible in the current environment, uh, which is an insane environment. And so in terms of working with with others. Um, I think that you find who uh, who you can trust and you can have in your small circle, whether it be associates, you know, the partners have their own group and the associates have their own group. And then maybe the senior attorneys 
our senior associates have their own little uh, club. Um, but, but I think it's about being independent. And then that also goes into uh, building your book of business. And, uh, you know, some firms don't encourage that. But being, even though they don't encourage it, I think the cheat code is still do it uh, because it puts you in a better position no matter what uh, long term. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's a challenge. <laughs> no doubt about it. Um, well, the last topic I want to touch on as we're starting to wind down our time is on um, hiring. And uh, you mentioned a little bit earlier uh, about uh, kind of career movement and, and uh, lawyers looking to um, you know, make sure that they're uh, appropriately compensated and, and, and feel like they're progressing or, or if not make a change, that kind of thing. Um, I, I'm curious as you've um, uh, at your, uh, for, as your old firm, for sure, I'm not sure if you've had a chance yet at your, in your current uh, new firm, um, in terms of evaluating uh, prospective associates and particularly those that are making lateral type moves like you were talking about before, um, what are some uh maybe keys or pointers you would give them um, in terms of uh, resume, cover letters, things that you've seen on application documents that stand out um, either positively or negatively that they should be aware of? This was something I didn't realize when I was a law student, but it makes a lot more sense now, um, which is I would very, very, closely tailor your resume to the job that you're applying to. And I didn't, I didn't fully realize how, you know, my resume was immigration packed because I, that was my interest in law school. And so when I was looking at resumes that we were receiving at the, the large immigration firm that I worked for, I, I was struggling to, you know, they, they would mention one thing related to immigration, but it would look like a you know, well, you you actually would probably be a better criminal defense lawyer, or you'd actually be a better insert something here because this is what your resume tells me. That's the story yeah. that I see of your life, and uh, and so I was like, wow, my resume, you know, with Catholic Charities in the immigration section, with yeah. U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, with a local immigration attorney, like they saw that and they were like, well, that tells the story. You're going to be an immigration attorney. So there you go. Uh, so, so doing that and then one page, no typos. Yeah. I think that people just don't think about what the, some person reading it really cares about seeing. Um, and you know, some accolades, uh, the person reviewing it doesn't really care about versus, you know, others, they, you know, it's kind of just big bullet points, make clear of your goal and that it aligns with where you're applying. Uh, yeah, so th that's kind of my recommendation. Yeah. Yeah. How can someone who maybe they, you know, you, I think in some ways were uh, fortunate or, you know, wise to select something early on in law school and be able to fill your resume with immigration law type of activities and jobs while you were in school. And that led to where, where you were able to get into your immigration career early. What about someone who, you know, got through law school, but didn't really know what they wanted to do and just kind of took a job out of law school. Maybe they're doing litigation, maybe they're doing transactional, whatever. Um, and this doesn't have to be specific to immigration. You can make it that way if you want, but I'm just thinking about from your perspective, how could someone who's got maybe a more generalized background after two, three years of practice, but says, you know what? I think I want to try this. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I'll like it, but I, I feel like I'm kind of interested in it. I'd like to try it. How could they get over the hump with uh, people that are hiring in like an immigration firm or a niche firm that they don't have that experience in yet? Yeah, that's a good question. I, like you said, I was fortunate. My first internship, I fell in love with immigration. Yeah. So uh, most people are not like that. Most uh, Many of my friends have changed practice areas. Uh, yeah. I've had friends that started in uh family law. And I'm thinking one friend was in family law and then went to construction law. Um, and I also have someone that's 40 years old and wants to change career paths. Um, and I can't imagine, I think that there's some age discrimination there as well, because it's, 
well, you've been in insurance defense for 15 years, you know, are you really going to change to transactional practice? Um, so which is, which is frustrating. So, yeah, I know that, that at, at, you know, at the bigger firm, they would, they would see people that have just no business, uh, being in the, the you know, immigration practice area for that reason, or they're already attorneys, but they don't have any experience in, and it was a huge red flag. So I think, uh, I think though, uh, my attitude would be to talk to as many people as possible that you can find in the practice area. Yeah. And uh, there are people like me who I'm very grateful for everyone that's helped me in transitioning to start my own practice, that I will talk to anybody and everybody. I'm talking to a, a Baylor Law student who reached out, uh, I'm talking to him on Friday. Um, and, and I'm, you know, wanting to be positive and pay it forward in these crazy times. And so I think a lot of people feel the same way. So I think that's the way to find the angle is to try to talk to as many people in the practice area that you're trying to get into as possible. And oftentimes you'll find someone who will give you a, an internship like opportunity um, and, and may end up getting overwhelmed with work and, and train you up. I, I think you'll in, end up there are enough positive, nice people out in the world that you'll eventually find uh, the right opportunity of, after you talk to maybe a hundred people, but, but it'll eventually happen. Uh, may, you know, for other people who are, People that are younger, uh, you know, a couple years out, then it, I think it's not as hard as, as people may think to change it if you're open to being in a uh, entry level job. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's right. And I do think the networking and the connecting with people that are in the practice area you want to get into uh, is, is really the key piece because ultimately someone's going to have to take a chance on you. It is a little bit of a risk. And that's usually going to come from a relationship. It may not have to be a super deep or long, you know, term relationship, but at least, you know, not from just a resume that's coming through uh, a, a job posting or something like that. Like that's probably not going to happen. All right. Well, uh, anything that we uh, that we haven't touched on yet that you would uh, want to share before we move on to our rapid fire questions here? Uh, no, I don't think so. All right. Awesome. Well, uh, let's hop into these uh, rapid fires. Uh, first one, name one trait or characteristic you most want to see in an associate. Being receptive to guidance. Nice. What habit has been key to your success? Hard work. Your favorite app or productivity tool? Todoist. Todoist. Tell me about that. It's basically like a to-do list um, that you can assign uh, team members. Uh, I, I, I make lists and I enjoy checking things off of lists. And so it's a digital list that you can share with your partners or colleagues for particular projects or just generally. And so I'll throw uh, something up on the to-do list and, and that helps me not feel overwhelmed with the amount of work and then also, you know, stay uh, on, on, on goal on point. Cool. We'll put a link uh, to that, uh, in the notes to this. All right. Uh, your favorite social distancing activity. Sitting outside on our patio and drinking coffee. There you go. Uh, that's uh, sounds like a good one. And then lastly, your favorite legal movie. My cousin Vinny. It's a classic. It's <laughs> tough to beat. <laughs> I was trying to think, do we have any immigration law legal movies? Yeah, that's a good. Uh, that's a good question. There, I'll there's, uh, what is it, ninety day fiance? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a TV show now. But, okay. But there's, okay. There's, okay. The, there's the proposal with Sandra Bullock yes. and Ryan Reynolds. Right. Yeah, that for sure. <laughs> awesome. Well, Matthew, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Uh, really appreciate it. It was fun to catch up. You too. Thanks. All right. My thanks again to Matthew Myers for joining us on the show. If you enjoyed this episode, would you consider doing two things for me? Would you subscribe so you don't miss an episode? And then would you rate and review the podcast in iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts? If you have suggestions or thoughts about the show, or if I could help you in any way, please email me directly, daniel at varsitysearch.com. Also, don't forget, if you or someone you know might be interested in making a job or career change, we have a number of opportunities that we're current we are currently working to fill. So please email me or go to varsitysearch.com 
slash lawyers. All right, that's it for today's episode of Lone Star Lawyers. Thanks again so much to each of you for listening. I'm Daniel Hare with Varsity Search, and we'll talk with you next time. Mm-hmm.